2004, which is about 600 pages. It was called Torture and Truth, and two-thirds of it were government documents that described this stuff in great detail. Um, so we, we like to think that our scandals are about revelation, which is to say once you hear about something, my God, the society jolts to attention, the judicial and congressional machinery uh, leaps into, uh, into action, there are investigations, there's punishment and so on, and that has not uh, happened. Actually, there's been revelation, there's been have been gestures toward investigation. In the case of Abu Ghraib, a few lower-level soldiers have been imprisoned, prosecuted and imprisoned. But the actual policymakers, whose decisions we know about in, in great in detail, we have these memos that uh, Department of Justice officials wrote. We have an immense amount of material, thousands and thousands of pages, describing in great detail how the decisions were made to use torture. We have the Red Cross report, which I published last spring, which describes these techniques in great detail, how they were used, what sequence they were used in. We have the Justice Department and CIA document describing how they were used. All this stuff is out there. And we like to think what prevents action is lack of information. But in fact, it's not information, it's politics. And politics at this point have determined uh, that we, in effect, as a society, decided not only to torture, but to live with torture. That has been our decision up to now. And I think we tend to console ourselves that this is a continuing scandal and there's a controversy about it. Um, but in fact, though we talk about it a lot, the decisions on the part of the government have been made and, and in a real sense unchallenged. Um, none of the people who made the policies have been prosecuted and even investigated. Um, and the decisions have not been formally renounced, uh, though Obama has said he will not use these anymore, and I believe him. Um, they are – torture, in fact, has gone from being an anathema, something uh, forbidden uh, and illegal under U.S. law and international conventions, to being a policy choice. In effect, for example, if there's another attack, uh, the government can go back to using it. I mean, it's essentially been defined as uh, legal um, under these under the Convention Against Torture and under U.S. law. Iraq. So, uh, fit Iraq into this story, as you do in stripping bare the body, uh, talking about it, as many do now in the past, although the U.S. has a full presence there right now. A war yes. is being waged. Well, it's an amazing American proclivity, I think, to you know, look at a particular place, direct its imperial gaze there. Uh, the elite learns all about the country. We debate what's going on in Mosul and Karbala and so on. Uh, the knowledge um, and, and the argument is furious for a few years, and then suddenly the gaze shifts elsewhere. It's like a spotlight that, that goes uh, now to Afghanistan and leaves Iraq uh, formerly uh, brightly lit um, in darkness. and we tend to leave uh, ruins behind. And Iraq, I think, is a very good example of that, that um, suddenly it's, it's gone. Uh, we can define it, um, uh, if we want to, as a success. Uh, that is the way it's talked about very often um, in, in the national press, one way or another. And in fact, of course, uh, it remains an extremely violent place. Uh, the insurgency still exists. Um, the United States essentially tamped it down uh, for a time by renting the insurgency, uh, by dividing it and hiring a good many um, of what we seem to refer to as the tribes, a very odd expression, but uh, Sunni organizations in the center of the country. Um, it is, as I say, there is still a very significant level of violence there. Um, but for reasons having to do, I think, with uh, Obama's ascension, mainly, and the current uh, political struggle over Afghanistan, what will be done there, um, we don't talk about it anymore. It's just, uh, it's just left the national scene. And what do you think needs to be said about it right now? Well, I think the, one of the things I would like to uh, uh, say about it is that it is somewhat a lesson in how we make decisions in our national evangelism our uh, conviction that seems to be ignited from time to time that the United States, with all its great power, I put that in quotes, um, can alter uh, for its own good a society that's distant, complex, uh, difficult to understand, um, and that has its own 
particular political strengths and dysfunctions. Um, we tend, I'm, I'm always astonished by how we talk about other countries. We're doing it now with Afghanistan that, you know, actually it's a political problem. We have to nation build. There was a, a piece in the front page of the New York Times in the last few days that talked about nation building going too slowly in Afghanistan. And it always leaves me a bit uh, breathless uh, to look at this idea that, I mean, if you've ever seen foreign aid actually at work on the ground, you, you, you can't do these things. You can't change societies uh, on this scale, particularly since U.S. intervention, uh, you know, it, it's like trying to fix a, wa a, a watch in your own shadow because you have the shadow of nationalism, which is to say every U.S. bit of U.S. forces that actually are on the ground cause their own very often extreme political reaction. Um, so it's impossible. It's a, kind of an indeterminacy principle. You cannot intervene without uh, a strong reaction, and very often a very strong reaction. And both of these societies, uh, the Iraqi and the Afghani, have in common the fact that they're strongly nationalistic and react very powerful to out, uh, powerfully to outside intervention. And the fact that we saw this uh, in spades in Iraq seems not to be recalled in any way during the debate, uh, debate about Afghanistan which is being carried on, it seems to me, largely because of domestic political reasons that stem in large part from decisions the Obama campaign made uh, while he was trying to become president to balance out the fact that he was a dove on Iraq. He uh, made very strong statements about the good war, the right war, Afghanistan, and so on. And also uh, his original speech about Iraq, of course, said, um, uh, I'm not against all wars, I'm against dumb wars, he said in, in 2002. Uh, and under that description, Iraq was, or Afghanistan, excuse me, was originally described or understood as the smart war. So here we are uh, with a debate that it seems to me uh, has a barely concealed but absolutely determinate uh, domestic political component that has very relatively little to do with Afghanistan at all. Um, so uh, what would I take from Iraq? I would take that lesson, that when we seem to be talking about somewhere else, Somewhere, somewhere else that we're going to affect very materially uh, with our own power, we actually very often are talking about ourselves. Uh, and it's something that we seem to repeat and yet never learn. Mark Dunn, I want to thank you for being with us. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you Thursday night um, at the New School. Uh, I'll be in conversation with Mark um, at the New School Tishman Auditorium Thursday night at 7 p.m. And all are invited. Tonight you're headed to Washington. Washington, D.C. Bus, Boys, Bus and Boys and Poets. And Poets, yes, yeah, 630. Um, and that's on 14th Street. And folks can link to our website at democracynow.org. We'll give all of those details. Mark Danner's new book is out. A collection of his writings over the years. It's called Stripping Bare the Body, Politics, Violence, War. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a minute. Thanks.
wealth, worth, risking your life so they can be a be first and enter the search for answers to questions about this 500 years of oppression through the addition. Who's the majority? Let's pull on the steering wheel together so we can change the direction for all humanity. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Angelique.